Hello everyone and welcome to the JM Report. I am Guru JM and this is episode 21 coming to you from the CSB studios in Tampa, Florida, the birthplace of pro wrestling. And unfortunately, I have to begin another episode with more sad news and it came completely out of nowhere considering the circumstances which I'll get into here in a moment. But uh, Jim D'Anville Nyhart has passed away at the age of 63 this past Monday morning in the very early hours. And, um, I mean, it's selfish of me or anyone to ask for this sort of thing to stop happening, especially when it happens on, at least in recent time, on a regular basis. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we had four in one day and there were there were a, a time period where one after another would take place of someone's passing, at least in the world of pro wrestling. And there would be, at the very least, one day apart, at most, maybe two, three days apart. And as the old saying or cliche goes, uh, these things come in threes, usually they were reserved for celebrities as celebrity deaths would happen in threes. But I think it's safe to say we could uh, scratch that as a cliche, at least in my opinion, because there's no way to predict this. There's no way to foresee anything like this and to put any kind of, uh, I don't know, like, you know, to give it a cliche, obviously. It's just a... it's just not necessary, I don't think. And because it happens in all in one day or maybe one day after another in a short period of time, it's just coincidence. Obviously it is. I mean, if, if you think about this, it's just complete coincidence. It'll be even more so if uh, those involved in passing away, for lack of a better term, had anything in common with each other other than their profession. And that was proven, again, a couple of weeks ago when Nikolai Volkov, Brian Christopher, Burkhouse Brown, and the father of uh, Trevor Lee, Tracy Caddo, all passed away in one day. And before that was tough enough winner, Matt Capitelli. Has it been a very good summer for pro wrestling in general? Especially when something like this happens but unfortunately, the most recent passing is Jim Neidhart. Only 63 years old, he has been, according to my research, long time retired from pro wrestling. And I've been very fortunate to still see a glimpse of his, of his recent actions, I guess, his recent... Uh, events of life on episodes of Total Divas. I only got to see the last season for uh, well, specific reasons. And I'm, I'm a big Nia Jax fan, and when she joined the uh, the, uh, the cast on the roster, if you will, that's when I uh, began watching it again. And there were many scenes where Natalia or Natty would go home in, in Tampa, Florida, and uh, visit mom and dad, that being Jim and Ellie. And it was just an amazing relationship to to experience. I mean, despite being a reality show, and for the most part, it is scripted, but compare the scenes to, say, an, an Instagram post that Natty has been posting a lot lately since, his fa- since her father's passing. And you can see and you can tell the, the genuine care and love that there was between father and daughter, and not not everyone gets to experience that, despite have being estranged or been a shady relationship. I mean, it sucks that uh, a, a lot of people cannot experience, let alone witness something like that. But I, I thought it was very heartwarming to see that Nightheart was still this basically this big teddy bear after all these years. After, after being a heel for so many years in the 80s and 
will return back in the late 90s to the World Wrestling Federation as part of the expanded Hart Foundation. And Jim was a nice guy. I say that because I met him and could not have been any kinder. Uh, definitely was worth chatting for a little while and got to meet him in, in New York. It's funny how I share these stories and it always ends up being in New York nine out of ten times, but that's when that's when and where a lot of these guys, even if they're still active, they have a lot of business in New York and uh, travel a lot, obviously, or far from home. And uh, the, the story, uh, uh, well, it took a while to find out exactly what happened. Again, this happened in the very early morning hours of this past Monday, uh, August the 13th. And immediately people thought that that it was an illness of some kind. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So after a thorough investigation, the uh, Pasco County Sheriff's Department after speaking with Elizabeth Nightheart or Ellie, the uh, the wife of Jim, according to her statement, Jim was having problems sleeping. So he got out of bed and went to adjust the thermostat. Ellie then said that as Nightheart went to touch it, he turned weirdly as if he was about to break out a dance and then fell into the wall and eventually the ground. She immediately called 911, believing that he was having a seizure and he was taking medication for that. Nyhart ended up with a four inch gash on his face when EMTs arrived. But he later died at the hospital at the age of 63. And the official cause of death, again, according to the Pasco County Sheriff's Department, the fall was the cause of death. And it was already uh, speculated, but Nightheart, Jim Nightheart, was already in the early stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease. No further details or information was given. I would imagine if they haven't already, look into this a little bit deeper than this. And others who took to social media after this information was let out, that that could have been when when Nightheart twitched, for, for instance, that could have been the trigger to his Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, oh, there's no, there's no T in that word. <laughs> but many believe that that was the, uh, the start of it and made him twitch the way he did or, or turned weirdly, as Ellie put it. And at this point, we can only speculate. And I, I always say when things like this are talked about, I'm no doctor. And obviously, I wasn't there to witness this. But at the end of the day, we lost a great legend in Jim the Anvil Nightheart, member of the Heart Foundation Tag Team, winning the Tag Team Championships two times with Bret Hart, who, by the way, at the time, took to social media and basically said that he had no words to say, that he was just in disbelief, and I don't blame him. Many of the pro wrestling community spread their condolences, shared the prayers and the thoughts to the family of Nightheart, Ellie, and especially Natalia, who was scheduled this past Monday for Raw in uh, North Carolina, I believe they were in. But obviously things changed. 
and she had to fly back home. It, it's just part of life. Even, even even if you're not in in a position where you're suffering from an illness or came down with something that went undiagnosed or ignored, and a, a lot of us, like me especially, you know, I, I'm. If you have, if you couldn't tell already, you know, I, I get pretty sensitive or emotional about things like this, and it's almost as if you know everyone, especially those that have passed on a personal level because you read about them, you hear about them, you, on occasion, if that, rarely run into them and have a quick conversation and then pretty much uh, fill in that that gap in your life where you got to meet a certain person that you've always seen on television or read about in papers or magazine articles and you got to meet them in person. And I, I always get starstruck. I, I always get, uh, I, I don't think there's a term for it, but it's almost as if, uh, like, they're really real. You know, I've seen them on TV all this time, and there he is or there she is right in front of me, and I'm shaking hands with them or taking pictures with them or conversating. It's, it's, a, it's one of those life experiences that you really can't uh, duplicate and you, you carry that with you the rest of your life. Jim Nighthawk would return on a number of occasions in the World Wrestling Federation. Uh, he, he literally went for a while unnoticed when I believe it was in the mid-90s he returned under a mask dressed in all yellow simply named Who. And according to Bruce Pritchard and something something to wrestle with, that was a favor out of Stu Hart asking Vince McMahon to uh, rehire Jim Neidhart in some capacity, even though Vince, either the story was according to Bruce, either he didn't want to or he just had nothing for him. But out of respect to Stu Hart, Vince would bring him in and do something. And eventually all of that would lead into the, the new foundation. Jim Neidhart had a had a short run as a singles competitor. That's when he started wearing those real big, baggy MC Hammer-looking pants with the uh, the, the checkered <laughs> uh, wrestling boots. And then along came Owen Hart, where um, he gave up the blue blazer persona. And first was trying to... It looked like, uh, at least in storyline, was uh, emulating Bret Hart because... Owen had a similar singlet and long pants wrestling attire, but it was in blue and white. And that didn't last too long. And then, oh, wait, we, we have Jim Neidhart, who's still active, and Owen, that for reasons wasn't really going up the card or getting anywhere, so they teamed him up for the new foundation. Then things happened. Neidhart was out of the picture. Then came High Energy. With Coco Beware and Owen Hart continuing the long baggy pants, checkered uh, boots, <laughs> which I thought could have worked. I mean, Coco, at least with WWE at that time in 92, when they had their tag match with the Hedge Ringers at Survivor Series, I, I thought Coco was already near the end of his run, but had a lot left to offer. And I don't think uh, at least one single short run with the tag championships would not have been too much to ask for for high energy. But nobody asked me, and uh, I wasn't there. So there was a few years gap in, in between 92 all the way to maybe uh, 94. I mean, it doesn't sound much, but at that time when it was only four to five pay-per-views a month, and... <laughs> It was easier to keep track of these things. Uh, Jim Neidhart will return for the King of the Ring in 94, where Owen Hart would win the title. And this will lead all the way to WrestleMania 10. And Neidhart wasn't on the card either. So I, I guess things worked out eventually, all the way getting into the Attitude Era, where eventually 
Night Hard will return again, surprisingly, at the MSG show for Raw, where the infamous Stone Cold Stunner, the first ever on Vince McMahon, also on that show was the debut of Cactus Jack in the WWF, and the formation of the Hart Foundation. Uh, it, it was already there with, between Davey Boy Smith, Owen Hart, and Bret Hart. But at the end of the show, for those who don't remember, there was a, a title match between Bret Hart and Goldust, only to have been interfered by Shawn Michaels. And then one by one came out DX, at the time was uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, China, and then Ravishing Rick Rude. Then came the Hunt Foundation. Debbie Boy Smith was, uh, was nursing a knee injury at the time, so he came wobbling down the ramp. Uh, Owen Hart would fly in. So it kind of evened things out a little bit. And then out of nowhere, Jim Neidhart just slides into the ring and the fans erupted because, like, holy crap, it's Jim Neidhart who, have been again, hasn't been seen since the, uh, the, the, the Hart family dispute or what they call it, the Hart family uh, dysfunction. What, I forgot what they call it during the new generation, but this is, this is not attitude error. And even Jerry Lawler, who was on commentator with Jim Ross, was like, hey, it's Jim Neidhart. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which sounded like a, a legit reaction had he not known that not, not how it was in the back, but it, it just uh, it sounded more more realistic with that reaction. And, of course, out came The Undertaker, who literally parted the sea in the ring, and it was left for... It, it was left between Undertaker, Brett, and Sean, and they went off the air after The Undertaker delivered a double choke slam on both guys and faded to black. And I remember this was not originally supposed to be a Monday Night Raw live TV show. It was just, just supposed to be a regular live event or house show. And they changed it into Raw. Probably, matter of fact, I, I don't even think it was supposed to be on a Monday, but there was, there was a scheduled garden show that I was planning on going, but the change were made. The changes were made, and became raw. Um, I would love to hear that podcast on something to wrestle with. But um, the advertised main event was a triple threat match for the championship: Undertaker, Sean, and Brett. And the match did t- did take place, but after Raw went off the air, <laughs> and. The match was eventually recorded and finally got to see it after all these years on the network. There's no commentating this. There's just uh, the sounds of the arena and the ring, of course. And I was like, okay. I mean, the match itself wasn't all that great, but knowing that uh, Bret Hart was still champion uh, gave, you know, it brought back memories like, you know, great. I mean, of course, this is way before the screw job. And not knowing that that was the uh, plan later on in the year. So it was great to see uh, finally that triple threat and fill in that gap, if you will. And for the rest of the year, for Jim Neidhart, that is, uh, it was a hit and miss. Uh, He didn't have a match at SummerSlam that year. Everyone else at the Hart Foundation did with stipulations added to the match Bulldog and Ken Shamrock had a loser would eat a can of dog food match (laughs) Owen Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin was already for the Intercontinental Championship but the loser would have to kiss the other one's ass Uh, Brian Pillman took on Goldust and if, uh, if, if Pillman were to lose he would have to wear a dress the next night on Raw which he did and the one that I knew could not have flown anywhere, even if they had an idea at that point what Survivor Series was going to bring. Bret Hart was facing The Undertaker for the championship, and this is where Bret Hart became five-time world champion. And had Bret Hart lost, the, t- the stipulation would go as Bret Hart would never again wrestle in the United States, which... It's just, really, who came up with that? And again, it's something that will not have flown anyway. And if it did, <laughs> give it a couple of weeks and Bret Hart would have been wrestling back on Raw. 
because at that time they were jumping back and forth between the States and, and Canada. But no, this is where Sean screwed The Undertaker out of the championship, all leading to Survivor Series where Nightheart was in a match, Team Canada versus Team USA. And if you want to fill in any more gaps, I guess this would be a good time to watch the documentary of Wrestling With Shadows, Hitman Heart, and post screw job, remaining members of the Heart Foundation at this time it was Bulldog, Owen, and Nightheart. Bulldog had already given his notice and basically had to buy himself out of his own contract to jump over to WCW. Jim remained behind, uh, if I remember correctly. His contract was not as long as everyone else's, so he just had to work certain dates and set out the rest of his contract. And there was an angle on Raw where supposedly, in in storyline, supposedly Sean and Hunter Hearst Helmsley cut a deal with Jim Neidhart and realizing that there's still hot water between them after what happened at Survivor Series, so Sean offered Jim a spot in DX, only to be screwed himself, where Jim Neidhart was raising both Hunter's and Sean's arms in the air in the ring, and from behind came China delivering a low blow, and they just beat the crap out of him, and Jim was never seen in the WWF for a long time after that. But what eventually jumped ship and joined Bulldog in WCW, where the tag team staple going for a while. Why didn't they reunite the Heart Foundation in WCWs beyond me? I mean, it wasn't as if factions or staples in WCW would have been <laughs> too much to ask for. You had a you had twenty thousand members of the NWO and the Horsemen, I believe, was still going on and. Uh, shortly after that, the Wolfpack came along, the LWO came along, even though that, that didn't last long either. So it just wouldn't have made sense. But don't want to get too far off track here. The fact is, Jim Neidhart is no longer with us. And Raw this past week did pay a, uh, a pretty awesome tribute, I believe, the day of. There was a nice video package of him and shown very rare photographs before he was a father, before he got into pro wrestling, of how he got the nickname The Anvil. And it's so it's so weird seeing Jim Neidhart clean shaven. It took me a while to uh, put that together. But when he was very young, yeah, that's um, he looked very different. And his hair was a little longer, not as long as Brett, but long compared to his later years. They showed footage, uh, no, I'm sorry, not footage, uh, but pictures of uh, him, Jim Neidhart, and his time with the NFL. And I remember Gorilla Monsoon saying about Jim Neidhart. I don't remember, I can't remember the telecast, but I remember like it was yesterday. They, Can you believe Jim Neidhart left the NFL because he thought it wasn't tough enough? So he came over to the World Wrestling Federation. That's. <laughs> Hope somebody can basically... Uh, Reuse that line today compared to other sports out there, but I think I think people want to look at it in kind as I did. But it is what it is. So Jim Neidhart, may he rest in peace. He had a great career, great family, the tradition, if you will, the legacy continues with uh, Natalia and Tyson Kidd, despite uh, his. Uh, his physical issues of whether or not he'll return to the ring at all is up in the air. So, uh, thanks for the memories, Jim. Another passing to note here, though not in, not impacting as much in the community of pro wrestling, but Aretha Franklin is etched in the uh, annals of time when it comes to WWE, especially WrestleMania moments, on two occasions. The first being at WrestleMania 3, singing the national anthem. 
ringside with piano and all. After Vince McMahon introduced her in the Pontiac Silverdome that no longer stands, unfortunately, in front of allegedly 93,000 people and the world watching, of course. It was a great rendition. I remember it fondly. And I believe uh, she was already living in Detroit, Aretha was. So it makes sense, a hometown gal to be part of WrestleMania. And then 20 years later, they would return to Detroit, WWE would, but at Ford Field. And the crowd wasn't as big, but uh, uh, about, what was it, 70-something thousand people? And once again, Aretha Franklin returned for the opening ceremonies. And I guess with a bigger budget, (laughs) at least WWE, um, had a chorus, had a, a band, I believe, off to the side. And once again, Aretha returned with her piano. May not have been the same one, but piano nonetheless. And again, give another rendition of of the national anthem, America the Beautiful. And the crowd popped big once again back in Detroit, coming full circle 20 years later. And it was great seeing her again. Uh, I I didn't follow her career much between that time. Well, you know, after WrestleMania 3, I honestly didn't know who she was. And then she appeared in several movies, including the Blues Brothers. Like, oh, okay, that's, that was a lady that was at WrestleMania. And unfortunately, Aretha Franklin passed away just yesterday of this recording on August 16th at the age of 76 at her home. And the reported cause of death is pancreatic cancer. All week I've been hearing on World News Tonight that uh, Aretha Franklin wasn't doing so well and that family and friends have been asked to come over and spend time with her. I didn't want to think of the worst, but I know a lot of people were, unfortunately, and it happened. And Aretha, again, don't know too much about her career or her upbringings, but of course, this is what uh, research can do for you, where you learn so much and the struggles that this lady went through and to able to stay on top this whole time, be given the moniker of the Queen of Soul, that's just not a slogan for a t-shirt, as they say. After so many years and listening to a lot of her music, a lot of her vocals, I believe that. There's a video floating around that was re, I guess, redistributed or re-uploaded a performance by Aretha Franklin at the Kennedy Center where the Obamas, when Barack was still in in office, was in attendance. And out came Aretha Franklin to a a tremendous standing ovation and began singing uh, Natural Woman. And Aretha began the performance sitting at the piano. And she, of course, she had a chorus off to the side. And towards the end of the song, she stopped playing piano, kept singing, and stood up. Wearing a, she was wearing a mink coat and walked over to center stage because the, the piano was a little bit towards the back of the stage and a bit to the side. So then Aretha stands up from, from the piano, walks over to center stage, further closer near the edge where the audience was, and brought her microphone, and when she really got into the lyrics, Aretha just took off her, took off her, her mink jacket, her mink coat, and just let loose with those high vocals, and chills went up and down my spine when I saw that again. When it first happened, it was in the news, because, you know, the Obamas, uh, mostly, but the performance of Aretha this night, how can it not have given you chills up and down your spine or given you goosebumps? So much so that Barack Obama himself was brought to tears and he was shown on camera 
with Michelle right next to him and co-wrote her of the song um, Carl King, I believe her name was. And tremendous performance, uh, tremendous lady. WWE staff and talent, including Vince McMahon himself, all paid tribute to the to the late singer through social media. And of course, they once again showed the performance from WrestleMania three, just leaving everyone in awe of her passing. And honestly, I didn't know that she was suffering from cancer. I don't know what her treatment was, if any. But again, maybe not specifically affecting the pro wrestling world, but definitely affecting everyone around the world, an icon of pop culture, as I mentioned on my pages. And she will be truly missed. And in the beginning of the show, you heard a little bit, uh, probably one of her famous tracks of all time and respect. And a lot of newscasters would mention in their in their bits, in their in their dialogue of reporting, that Aretha would demand respect. And quite honestly, I think she deserved it, even more so now than ever. So with Jim Neidhart and Aretha Franklin, I want to extend and offer my prayers and condolences to all their family and friends and anyone that's been affected by these passings this week. And I don't think from now on, my, my own personal note, I don't think I want to say, I hope something like this doesn't happen anytime soon again, because I'll just be back here again reporting someone else's passing, and I just don't want to jinx it anymore. I know it's not my fault. It's not, it's not anyone's fault considering the circumstances that these two individuals passed, but, you know, believing in uh, m- uh, myth, if you will, or be careful what you wish for and stuff like that, yeah, I think I'm going to tone that down. And report it when they happen, and have the information and facts available at the time to bring to you and go from there. But may Jim and Aretha rest in peace. This past week on Raw, the show opened with Ronda Rousey paying a tribute to Jim Neidhart and pointing out that Natalia could not be there as she went home to be with family. And it's almost, I guess, tradition or at least expected that whenever someone from the pro wrestling world passes and they've had a, or they will use a familiar maneuver or wrestling hold or a spot, if you will, a finisher, a signature move, that someone would use it on the show. Someone from the current roster. And to be honest, uh, I was kind of expecting it. I just didn't know who would do it or how and when. So right before the match itself happened where it was a triple threat tag team match for the Raw Tag Titles, the Revival taking on Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt and the champions, the B-Team. And Bully Ray, or Bubba Ray Dudley, took to Twitter and pointed out, and I'm paraphrasing, that he hopes that someone brings out the heart attack maneuver as a finisher, at least. And sure enough, the Revival used it on Matt Hardy about midway match. And Bully, Bully, <laughs> Bully Ray didn't like that the heart attack was a finishing move, but it was used in the middle of the match. And Bully Ray would have preferred for it to be the winning move, but that wasn't the case here. Uh, I think it was used out of respect. Obviously, the revival team, as many 
see them as an old school type of tag team. And, you know, I could see that. I just wish the, the like many Mac Melee talents could be used more, more frequently, more regularly as they use everyone else. Otherwise, they're going to be regulated to main events. And not many people watch that. Not, not on a network anyway. But at least, um, at least it was used. You know, of course, there wasn't a finishing move, and that's not the the revivals or anyone's tag team's finishing move. Not not right now, anyway. But it it could have been used as a setup for a finisher, but it wasn't. Uh, I I can understand Bully Ray's uh, upset here, his frustration about it. But the fact that it was used at at all, I think, was good enough, paying homage to the Heart Foundation. But again, I, I understand where Bully Ray's coming from. And a, a lot, many, many of his followers responded to this and like, yeah, you're right, Bully, it should have been the finisher. And it's a finishing move. Why, why not incorporate it as that? What can you do? If anything, take it up with the creative and the agent who put that match together. And of course, Vince, who has to approve it and say, yeah, go with that finish. In other news. Dave Meltzer got himself in a bit of hot water this week after recent remarks about the appearance and breast enhancements of former NXT standout and current SmackDown rookie Payne Royce. This was on the August 9th edition of the Wrestling Observer as Meltzer was conversating with uh, co-host Brian Alvarez and Reading this uh, in context on paper is one thing. I haven't I haven't heard the actual audio to the show, but I would love to know what led up to this. But I was able to, however, I was able to pick out the transcript of the audio and specifically now we're down to the conversation where Alvarez and Meltzer were talking about the iconics. And for those who've heard Dave Meltzer speak on audio sometimes to me anyway it's as if you know get to the point already you drag out your your explanation and detail but still waiting on your point of what you're speaking of so i'm going to read his comments and alvarez's response verbatim here so bear with me if it sounds a little bit off or different than how i normally speak here on the on the jam report so here we go Meltzer starts off. I thought the Iconics had a cool act in NXT, and on the main roster, I don't get a thing out of them. I don't think their promos are particularly good. Their wrestling isn't good. I think they even like, I think Payne Royce's transformation to look more attractive. I don't know. I don't want to say, but I don't think that, and Alvarez cuts in, that they were more attractive in NXT? Meltzer says, I thought so, yes. To me, yes, uh, I would say so, but that's neither here or there. Alvarez says, no one's saying she isn't unattractive, by the way, everybody. Meltzer says, I know. Yeah, I didn't say that at all, but she doesn't stand out to me. When she was in NXT, she did. She was a lot lighter. So that part of the conversation is what got him in hot water, more melted than anything. Why Alvarez would even ask, what, are you trying to say that she's unattractive? Even if you think that's what he was trying to say or where he was going, why say that? I mean, and, and, and you're not even trying to be controversial or anything like that, but uh, I, I just think it was unnecessary. But here... He did, Alvarez did, and Meltzer. Uh, I don't know if he thought he was painted into a corner, but he decided to answer the question and further add on to it. But it, again, it was at this point where the co-host found himself in the backlash or unwillingly at this time, knowing that they were, were going to be. But once Meltzer said, I don't want to say... Yeah, you know, you that's what you feel, that's what you think. You you're doing everything but saying it. And immediately fo- following Meltzer's comments in the case of Alvarez de- declaring 
No one else is saying that she's unattractive. The floodgates opened up and Payne Royce herself took to social media. Uh, Twitter to be exact. So once Royce got one of these comments, she lashed out at the pro wrestling historian and what quickly quickly became a star-studded roast of Dave Meltzer. <laughs> I never met the man before. I can understand how and appreciate many, especially back in the day in the in, uh, 80s and 90s, where when there wasn't internet, there was Dave Meltzer and PW Insider and the Wrestling Observer where they would potentially spoil outcomes of pay-per-views and specific uh, events and tell you the comes and coming and goings of uh, individuals, contract signings, uh, contract expirations, and basically surprises of, uh, and things of that nature. And, of course, when, when things don't turn out the way Meltzer would report them, he'll come out and say, well, they changed plans or they changed their ideas, they changed their mind, which in many cases that was true. And others, who knows? Who knows why things were changed? And if Milton were to, it's, it's to believe that the facts he's reporting are just that and turns out to, turns out to be something else, who's to say? And uh, that's when people like Bruce Pritchard and the, 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 there isn't a, a dull moment where Bruce doesn't try to bury Meltzer, even though he calls him every name in the book, but doesn't really know Dave. They're not... They're not truly friends, but they are at least are aware of each other's existence. And Meltzer, to his credit, defends himself in every possible way. But And he swears to a lot of these stories, recent ones or ones in the past, but that was the plan. That was the idea. That's what they said. It's, times like that, I just say, quit while you're ahead. But back to Payne Royce. She uh, put out a tweet tagging Dave Meltzer and... She said, so what would you have me do, Dave? Starve myself? This is how nightmares for young women start. The females in your life must be proud. This, of course, would chime in many people in who's who. And looking at the, uh, the names that were replying or chiming in on this, yeah, I don't think they've ever, or have at least one point in their career, have mentioned they're not too fond of Dave Meltzer. From Page to Ember Moon, Seth Rollins, even Eric Bischoff would say Payne Royce has earned or gained a new fan, something to that extent. So Bischoff, he's never been a fan of Meltzer's, uh, similar to Bruce Pritchard's where, you know, they have these ideas and things will change and Meltzer will go on to them and say, well, because he changed it. So it becomes a he said, she said nonsense. Dave, to his credit, will later apologize. And he tweeted out, I would like to apologize to you, being Payne Royce. You are an exceedingly attractive woman. I do re realize the lengths of the pressures on women in the entertainment world to maintain unnatural looks at times, and I'm glad you pointed this out. I don't think this, this necessarily buries the hatchet, but this is what happens and heaven knows that many people try to be careful what they say, but in the heat of the moment, and you're basically put on the spot. And this is where a lot of people make that mistake, where they believe, or people, well, I was put, I was pressured into it, I was put on the spot, and you're given an answer. You know it's wrong, or probably shouldn't say it, but you do anyway. And then here comes the backlash, less than 24 hours later. It, it's easier to say that now, looking back in hindsight, but... I think people just to, just need to be a little bit more smarter. Hell, I mean, I, I could slip up here without realizing and post it up on my YouTube channel, and then I'm getting backlash because I said I made a comment that I should not have said about anything or anyone, and then not only would I have to, well, not not retract my statements, but apologize for it and try to clear myself and explain if I meant to say those comments, why I said them, or didn't realize that I said it in an offensive manner. Dave here was exactly doing just that. Hopefully uh, he sticks to it and is careful in the future because now it's not the time to be uh, criticizing women in any profession, especially about their looks, their appearances, 
I mean, it, it's an it's a unique attire for the for the iconics. I'll give them that. And to be honest, there was a time where I couldn't tell them apart. Now, if that's a sin, or if that's guilt on my part, then I apologize. But if the argument here is whether or not they're attractive, and if and if you're asking me, then I say, yeah, they're very attractive. And if there were a women's tag team division now, how can they not be a top contender for the championships? Hopefully that will be brought up by the time Evolution comes around or be right before, if you will. But the Mae Young Classic is still yet to uh, debut on the network. And no, I'm not going to spoil that because I don't know what happened. I don't want to spoil it for myself either. Not to defend Meltzer. That'll be the last thing I'll do. But I'm sure at some point in everyone's lives, whether you're male or female, you came across that one attractive person. You don't know who they are. You don't know what their name is. You have no idea what they do or what they're about. But you you still can't ignore the fact that they're attractive. So maybe one day you find yourself approaching this person and you introduce yourself, how you're doing, what brings you here, all the way to what do you do for a living. So everything's fine up to that point, but maybe they go on social media or you find them on Facebook, for example, and you see them liking or commenting in a positive way for a post or video or picture that you will find the complete opposite of. And you realize that you just met this person thinking that he or she is one way, but because they have certain beliefs that you don't, all of a sudden you're turned off. That happens. I've known people, when it comes to elections, literally sacrifice their friendships because your friend have voted for one person and then you find yourself voting for the for the opponent. You can see someone extremely attractive on television making a speech and then get to the point where they want to see changes made and it's not going to benefit you in the long run, whether it's, you know, for health insurance, for example, or maybe at the jobs making some changes and it's going to screw you over in the long run. But the announcement came from that one person you thought was so fly, so good looking, so fine. And then you just turned off. In the case of Peyton Royce, she's playing a heel on television. And she's she, along with Billy Kay, they've said and done things as a heel they're supposed to not like. They're supposed to hate on them for performing such acts. On top of that, they happen to be very attractive women. But it's a little bit different, at least, I, at least that's how I see it, where they could be attractive as all hell and say the certain things that they say and do the, the, you know, the jump attacks on Asuka for a while back or jumping on Charlotte or Becky Lynch. I, I still find them attractive while getting their beat down on. <laughs> so it's, it's just really strange that the human mind works that way. It took me a long time to understand that. But like, well, I thought you found her pretty. Like, well, she doesn't like dogs. So I don't like her anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a very weak example, but you can replace the, ex- the excuse with anything. And as you get older, people change, in a sense, for the better. Whether it means to maybe change their mind on something or someone and... For all that time, you thought that other person you found attractive thought the opposite, but all of a sudden you find yourself on the same level and the same page as they are. Are you going to find them attractive again? Or just carry on mutually with the same beliefs? Like, well, okay. At, At the end of the day, you find yourself believing what you want to believe because that's what you want to believe in. Or in this case, that's someone who you want to believe in. Appearances should be the last thing to describe everyone. And this is where I've been talking about cliches today. You don't judge a book by its cover. I couldn't imagine the emotion or the uh, the state of mind that Pan Royce was going through when she first heard about this or when she was told or maybe she heard it herself before she put out that tweet. But at least 
though it was in, an, in a uh, defensive manner, but at least uh, she took the uh, professional route where she's not calling Meltzer by any names or insulting him or whatever. I mean, yeah, there, there was that line about the women in his life should be proud of him, but that's more of a jab at him because how does he see women in his life? Hopefully this was a wake-up call for him and take the necessary steps moving forward. By the way, if you hear any background noise, I apologize for that as uh, other parts of the studios are being used. And uh, <laughs> there's only so much I can do from, from my point to uh, isolate it, but we move on. During his appearance on the Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast this week, Daniel Bryan revealed that while he hasn't yet signed a new contract with the WWE, he is incredibly close to doing so. Uh, the former champion had then linked with a potential spot at All In on September 1st, but judging by the comments he made, it would appear as if it's only a matter of time until the deal is struck with WWE. So this is what Brian had to say on Sam Roberts' show. I think it's about a 90-plus percent, I would say. It's likely I will sign with WWE. I have not resigned yet, but it could happen as soon as the end of, the, of this week. This week, of course, being SummerSlam weekend. And Daniel goes on to say, and it might be in a couple of more weeks or whatever it is. Now, this is where I'm chiming in because even before people started realizing that Brian's contract is up, pretty soon, and I still believe it's on September 1st, ironically the day of, all in. So this is not a rumor, this is not something I've heard, this is my thought, this is my take on this. Brian said it would probably happen at the end of the week, where he's scheduled at SummerSlam to take on The Miz this Sunday, and I'll have the rundown in a little bit. But what if Brian signs, say, a few days extension to, to, end, to end the month? And then September 1st comes, he doesn't sign. I was like, oh, just give me a, give me a day to think about it. Or, or, or I'll get back to you uh, this day of the week or whatever, or the day after all in. And the idea and the plan or discussion maybe among others who, who put together all in have, have suggested to Brian, just in case, or hypothetically speaking, if you don't resign with WWE, would you want to join All In, even if it's a one-night deal or a one-off? I would love to see Daniel Bryan appear at All In. I'm sure many of us do. As long as it doesn't, I don't. So far, I don't think it's not. As long as it doesn't conflict with any other WWE schedules, because All In is on a Saturday, and. Usually live events where Daniel Bryan has already asked to take time off of. He's not scheduled for any house shows or live events on weekends anymore. Sometimes there are exceptions, but for the most part, he's not attending them. So what if that's the idea? Bryan still rides out the remaining contract with WWE. Uh, it expires the day of this all-in event but doesn't get back to them, say, on the 3rd, which will be a Monday, and say, okay, if the offer's still on the table, let me resign. The one thing I'm not aware of, as many contracts, if not all of them, have this clause in them where WWE has the option themselves to renew it for them without having their permission, so to speak. Now, again, I'm not, I don't know the full details, but I'm not sure once... WWE pulls that card, if you will, to sign that extension that they can only, only use it once. Or if that clause carries over. I'm not sure. I'm not aware of that. If anyone does, please let me know in the comments. But it's interesting how they put these contracts together. But yet you see Chris Jericho, who has made it clear that he's not a, uh, currently not contracted with WWE, but in the last year or so, he jumped over back and forth these imaginary lines between WWE and New Japan and it all worked out for him. Not assuming that's what Daniel Bryan wants to do or 
has been su suggested to do. But it would work, again, even if it is a one-off deal. And that it does take place, it works out fully all in events, and that he still has the option or the opportunity to go back to WWE with his, uh, I guess, demands, if you will, to continue forward with the company. But time's running short. We're about three weeks inside, I would say. Actually, two weeks, but we'll see what happens with Daniel Bryan. And if he shows up alone at all in more power to him, it would just add more prestige to the card and make it that more important versus WWE. And speaking of uh, contracted wrestlers or would-be contracted wrestlers, Rey Mysterio was pulled out of a scheduled appearance at the Northeast Wrestling event, which is going to be held next week. And the reason? Rey is currently in a contractual situation with WWE. Mysterio has been negotiating with WWE for a return, but in a past interview, Mysterio said that they were trying to work out the right deal, but that hasn't happened yet, nor has it been secured. Which is strange. I'm not sure how this works exactly, but Mark Henry is scheduled to be at the same card that Rey Mysterio is pulled out of. And last I checked, Henry was still on the WWE contract. And this goes back to the previous statement about Daniel Bryan. As long as it's not conflicting with WWE events that you're expected to appear, then you would be allowed to perform anywhere else as also not being televised. But Ray was still pulled out because they were still in contract or, or in a contractual situation. So you mean to tell me the man can't work in the meantime until those details are worked out? According to Ray, nothing's been signed or set in stone yet and he can't work anywhere? Someone please help me understand this because you're basically pulling a Dixie Carter here. Dixie Carter pulled Tyrus out of a show one time. This was a few years ago where he was still with uh, Impact. And at the time, there was a money situation. No one was getting paid of sorts. And like many others, Tyrus took uh, indie bookings. And for reasons only that Dixie would know, she pulled him out of that show. Uh, I believe even threatened a a lawsuit if he didn't. So he, Tyrus did lose out on um, a guaranteed payday at this uh, indie show, only to be called in for some kind of meeting at Impact. And it was shown on television where he just sat there in the background. Obviously, they didn't want to be there. But I don't blame him. And then was not used. So Dixon pulled Tyrus out of a guaranteed payday just to have him sit in the background looking all miserable as he can be, and do absolutely nothing with the man. Not on television, not an interview, not a promo, nothing. I mean, what kind of thinking or logic is that? But you would, you would have to ask Dixie. So I'm, I'm kind of getting the same vibes here. Whomever is the one that decided, um, I'm sure Vince had something to do with it, but I wouldn't say Vince is directly responsible. But someone, maybe talent relations, maybe a legal team, found out about this car that's been announced for many weeks, if not months, about this upcoming Northeast uh, wrestling event, and Rey Mysterio has been pulled. Again, I mentioned this before, maybe when it was first announced, about uh, Rey Mysterio being a or one of the downloadable characters for the 2K19 game coming out in October. And I mentioned, well, that doesn't mean anything. We've seen how many names mentioned as a downloadable character but we never saw them return it's happened before yeah with with Goldberg he came back and I think that was only because mainly of the nostalgia pop that the commercials gotten I was like holy crap Goldberg is back doesn't mean he's coming in and that took a lot of talking a lot of convincing but he returned there were a few other names but wasn't guaranteed so maybe they had plans for Ray in relation to the video game. Who knows? But that's not a good enough or big enough reason or excuse to pull him out of a show where he's guaranteed a, a payday 
and I'm not going to do anything that day of. So he probably just sit at home doing what exactly? I don't know. I guess we'll find out through social media. But it just sucks that you're under contractual situations or in talks with a, with a talent. But in the meantime, you, you can't or don't allow them to work. I, I, I just don't understand that. Dean Ambrose has returned this past week on Raw. And <laughs> yeah, he did like a, like a version of Triple H's mini-me. And, and I mean that in a good way because compared to the last time we saw him, uh, Ambrose clearly was not hitting the gym as much as he slimmed down a lot. But even before that happened, he was in great shape. Uh, pretty, pretty lean, cut-looking uh, physique that he had. But his return here, he looked jacked. I mean, the, the shoulders, the, the traps there. Just looked amazing. And he he had a match, dark match on Raw after the fact, but he's back. So what happened here during the, the contract signing segment between Ziggler, Drew McIntyre, and supposed to be Seth Rollins, but throughout the night, Seth Rollins was mentioned and shown social media footage of he being in Asia, doing promotional work. And obviously the illusion here, if you will, the story was that he was not in the States. So Ziggler was lobbying for a forfeit of his match against uh, Reigns for the, I'm sorry, uh, Seth Rollins for the Intercontinental title match at SummerSlam because Seth Rollins wasn't present at Raw. So Ziggler and McIntyre kept talking about how great they are and took shots at Seth Rollins and Kurt Angle, who was in the ring for the setup and, and the contract signing. So the crowd started chanting, burn it down. And this finally brought out Seth hitting his entrance music, and said that some traveling issues were faced, but not by him. There was a clause in a contract which it enabled Seth Rollins to have someone on his side at SummerSlam. And here's where Rollins introduced Ambrose. He comes out and both of them run into the ring and beat down on Ziggler and McIntyre. And Ambrose will be in Seth Rollins' corner this weekend at SummerSlam facing Dolph Ziggler for the Intercontinental Championship. This definitely changes up things a little bit. But moving forward a little bit, Ambrose is already being advertised for Hell in a Cell. So plans were made in advance for his return after nine months. Originally thought it was going to be eight, but I guess he needed that extra month to get extra jacked, and Ambrose has returned. Speaking of this past week on Raw, did anyone else notice... I saw something. I couldn't tell what it was. And then as the week went on, there was coverage of this on YouTube and WWE.com. But there was a bat at ringside during the women's match at the opening of the show and got a little too close for comfort if you're Ronda Rousey. And she looked scared. <laughs> she, she took uh, steps to the side as a bat flew ringside and it wasn't a huge bat. If anything, and and I've seen a few, you know, Animal Planet videos and, and TV shows. Uh, this little thing, I would guess it wasn't a newborn either. So it had to have been at least a teenage bat, if that makes sense. And it flew really low to the ground. And if, and at one point actually flew around the ring. There was a unseen footage from the live shots of the, of the Raw broadcast. And that's what they used on their YouTube channel. And you see the you see the bat literally flying around the ring, running laps or flying laps in his case. And Ronda was just a little bit petrified, and it's not something you see every day, obviously. So there, more than likely, it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure after this, if they haven't already, the arena is going to do a bit of a, a sweep of the arena and make sure that there aren't too many more bats hanging around in some corner or in the ceiling somewhere. But, again, interesting. Again, it's not something you hear about or see every day. It was just obviously caught way off guard, especially with Ronda's reaction to it. Probably probably not would have been too fond of it getting a little closer and maybe sinking its teeth into Ronda's leg there or, or her arm. But I, I, thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was so out of place that you couldn't help but to laugh. I'm like, there's a freaking bat flying around the ring. 
And some of the fans wing, ringside caught wind of it and the pointing out the bat with their fingers and they're taking out their their smart devices trying to film the thing. But that bat was so quick and I think commercial break, someone went out there and tried to chase it away and I, I don't know if they ever caught it, but <laughs> that, that's that's entertainment, folks. That really is. <laughs> Chris Jericho will, will appear in a horror movie directed by Kevin Smith called Kilroy Was Here. And Chris Jericho will play the gator chaser that's described as a nasty-ass South Florida streamer. Whatever that means. Um, the movie is a low-budget indie film where Kevin has also cast his students and Jericho was asked to operate the camera for his scene. Interesting. Interesting. Kevin Smith went on to Instagram and say, every crew member wears multiple hats on a low-budget film. So last night, when Jericho got to set, I asked the master podcaster and WWE icon to not only act, but also operate the camera for himself in his scenes as well. When presented with this info, did the Fozzie frontman show trepidation? No way. Homie goes with the flow and not only crushes his character and dialogue, but shoots a damn spooky scene as well. That's the kind of actor or actress you need in a, on an indie film, a partner who will not only carry the end of the bargain, but also help elevate the entire production as well. That That is a huge compliment coming from Kevin Smith. And yeah, I look forward to this now knowing that Chris Jericho filmed his own scene in, in a horror movie, nonetheless. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look. I'll keep an eye on to see when the release date will be for this. Kilroy was here. <laughs> if you're a Just Incredible fan, I got some unfortunate news for you. Uh, he was arrested for violating a protective order uh, this past Tuesday. And according to the authorities in Connecticut, he was held on a bond of $7,500. At the time, there was no information yet on how the protective order was violated. He was arrested last year for disorderly conduct and threatening in the second degree. He was issued a protective order because it was on a domestic issue. And he posted bond after the fact, and Justin Credible would uh, make a statement and goes on to say, this will be my one and only statement on the matter. Everyone knows I have a history with addiction, and I have worked hard these last few months to battle my demons and keep my family strong. Like all marriages, mine has its ups and downs. I have regained my sobriety, and today I am clean, and tomorrow hope for the same. All I can do is to take it one day at a time and work on being the best me that I can be. Issues came about Monday night, and I have regretted in every minute since. There was no domestic violence that night. The only one to call the police was me. I was arrested because I have had an old protection order that was still in place from a previous incident. I will not make excuses for any of the actions that happened that night, but I promised to my fans, my friends, and my family that the man, Peter Polacco, will never be a negative headline again. And the character Just Incredible still has many great moments left. In closing, I would like to thank all the fans that stuck beside me through this ordeal. Thanks to my countless friends who were who were there to pick me up and help me get back into the solid ground. Most importantly, thank you to my lovely wife and kids who know that though I am not perfect, my love for them is unconditional and we'll get through this fight together. Stay tuned, guys, because chapter two of my life is not only going to be a hell of a lot better, but it's going to be done right. 2018, 2019 is going to be our year. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't know too much about the story other than what I mentioned here. And uh, Justin Krebel, someone else I met in New York, was not aware of his demons, but last I heard, he was part of the... Uh, the lawsuit about uh, WWE and the concussions, uh, well, along with many others, and was also in a dispute of sorts with WWE and the network regarding royalties. And 
Sunday Night Heat was uh, uploaded a, a while ago, so I don't know if that was settled or just completely ignored, but there were a lot of episodes of Sunday Night Heat that had just incredible in it, along with many others that are part of the concussion suit. So I guess the idea is not to benefit off of that while still moving forward, but I'm sure it's a separate issue. And some of it had to have been, well, settled. Settled would imply that they were rewarded something, but I do not know the facts on, on the end of that. So I'm assuming something had to have been agreed upon at the very least. Otherwise, Sunday Night Heat would not have been appearing or debuting on the network at all. There's a new video online, and it's the NWO. Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash are back together, and the trio are seen in the video in a full NWO attire. And the dialogue says, 22 years, and it still is, as always, will be for life, Hollywood, too sweet. It is yet not known what the band is planning, but there is some announcement coming on October 27th, which could be related. Hogan would say, something really special is about to go down. We shall wait and see. Sin Cara went under the knife this week to have surgery on his right knee, and this was confirmed by WWE. However, it was not uh, mentioned or provided any details of how long Sin Cara will be out of action. As Sin Cara had his knee checked out by WWE doctors last weekend and found scar tissue, which was later removed. And I, I cannot relate to that personally, but I know of many people who have had surgeries many, many years ago. It's completely different than how it is now. And the internal scarring can grow and just just wreak havoc all over your organs or your veins or whatever's attached nearby and can make some damage, unfortunately. So that's what, assuming that's what this story is about, but luckily they caught it early enough where it's not going to cause any chaos later on for his career. Congratulations to AJ Styles, who is now the longest reigning champion in SmackDown history, as of today, reaching the 283 mark. He surpasses the previous record holder of JBL, and definitely far off from breaking CM Punk's record, but I'm sure he'll get there depending on the outcome of this week's SummerSlam. Maybe Lesnar will get there, but it's definitely a, an accomplishment in itself. Ever since the brand split many, many years ago, I think it was 2002, that they would have to venture in this direction where you have so many champions, so many divisions, and... It will make sense to to recognize such a long reign, I believe, since October of last year or so, uh, defeating Jinder Mahal on an episode of SmackDown from England. And, yeah, it definitely makes sense to have a long-reigning champion on SmackDown and whatever day Lesnar's up to on Raw, despite the lack of title defenses. But I'm just about out of time here, but... The idea with Lesnar, last I heard, is possibly, and this is according to warculture.com, by the way, um, that the story now is Lesnar may walk away from SummerSlam as Universal Champion while trying to get back into UFC at the same time and compete back and forth, similar to what Lashley did with Bellator and, and Impact. So maybe a deal was struck and uh, i mentioned this would keep, this could be a possibility and i say why not but you could still work for two different companies like this but in the case of the universal title you don't need it to to take that with you you just don't but it is what it is i will have the results of NXT takeover brooklyn and summerslam for you next time on the jm report but in the meantime just want to make mention that the stories shared here, my sources were multiple, and I just want to acknowledge them right now from WrestleZone.com, Wikipedia, Forbes, PW Insider, and WorldCulture.com. So everyone enjoy SummerSlam weekend with TakeOver tomorrow night and the 48-hour long-running SummerSlam coverage on Sunday. And again, I'll bring all the results to you next time 
on the Jam Report. So un- until then, everyone, please be careful out there. Be safe. Be good. Enjoy the remaining of summer. And all the kids that have gone back to school already, good luck in the new year. And this is Godo JM, and I'll see you next time.